Well, so when I start out on these tours, I usually have an, a, an agenda and prepared remarks, and, and then as I make my way through my venues, and I hear the feedback, and I feel the ambiance of the, of the people and the, the throb of the zeitgeist, it all sort of just simply dissolves into an ongoing commentary on our moment in space and time and the various dimensions, adumbrations, and opportunities of our dilemma. But I want tonight to couch it for you in the context of, uh, I guess, an extended metaphor. We could talk about these things many ways, but I find in this particular extended metaphor uh, illuminating. And I start by recalling <clears throat> an observation from someone whose name rarely falls from my lips, uh, and that would be Gurdjieff. And Gurdjieff said at one point, or was known to comment, that people are asleep, he said. And he, by implication, suggested people awaken. I'm not sure if he fully grasped the implication for his own product line had that occurred. Uh, but in any case, you're on it, you're with me, yes. <clears throat> it's very hard to give these lectures in such a way so that every person hears something different, uh, which is what is supposed to be going on, you know. Well, so thinking about this comment, that people are asleep, uh, I, I, uh, I see several implications. I ask myself, what is awake in my own notion? And I thought to myself, awake is, for me, awake is where the laws of physics are fully operable, you know? hurled objects shatter, electricity shocks, I cannot fly, uh, the laws of physics are in operation. In that domain, I consider myself to be fully awake. Now, in terms of occult and spiritual traditions, the admonition to awaken always seems to imply that higher consciousness is approached through an expansion of clarity and awareness. And I, I, that seems obvious, I don't argue with it as a rationalist. But as somebody who has run the edges, I've noticed something somewhat counterintuitive to that teaching. And it's this, it's that to contact the cosmic giggle, to, to have the flow of casuistry begin to give off synchronistic ripples, white caps in the billows of the coincidental ether, if you will, <laughs> to achieve that it requires, it, it, a precondition is a, a kind of unconsciousness, a kind of drifting, a certain taking your eye off the ball, a certain assumption that things are simpler than they are almost always precedes what Nirsiliad called the rupture of plane that indicates, you know, that there is an archetypal world, an archetypal power beyond, uh, behind profane uh, appearances. And in my own life, for those of you who are conversant with my output, uh, when I went to the Amazon in 1971 and had the experiences that are described in true hallucinations, I had been for many months before that in Asia, smuggling, hanging out, and, and I had taken my eye off the ball. I had become very gentle, very relativistic in my uh, approach to other people's opinions and behaviors. I was easygoing what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Too easy going. Uh, and in that situation of semi-unconsciousness and openness, uh, the cosmic giggle approaches. And I compare this, this is closing of a theme, I compare this to sleep. 
or to states that lie between waking and sleeping. And so, again, an odd take on this remark uh, of Gurdjieff. I remember someone many years ago said to me, uh, they evoked the symbol of the yin and the yang, the two, two tiers folded against each other within a circle. And this person, who was no Rishi, Roshi, Geshe, or Guru, but simply observant, said, uh, it's not the black side, it's not the white side, it's the interface, it's the edge. And I found, uh, by observing sleep, and some of you may recall the motto in Athanasius Kircher's Amphiatrium Sapientium that's chiseled over the alchemist's doorway. I can't do it in Latin, but it says, while sleeping, watch. While sleeping, watch. Uh, and I've noticed that while going to sleep, there is a barrier, a place in the process of going to sleep that is like a mercurial edge. It's a river. It's an, a zone of hypnagogia. You often pass through it post-orgasm. It's a place of drifting amoeboid colored after-image lights and then true hallucination, uh, images, strange, transcendental or transpersonal. Uh, images. Well, so then, so far in the context of pursuing this extended metaphor about sleep, I've talked basically, uh, essentially about the individual's relationship to the concept, to the fact. But there's also a social or a political, a species-wide implication. Uh, it occurs to me that at any given moment, because of the way the planet is as a thing, some considerable percentage of human beings are asleep, always, and many are awake. And so if the world soul is made of the collective consciousness of human beings, then it is never entirely awake. It is never entirely asleep. It exists in, uh, I guess you can hear me. It, it, it exists in some kind of indeterminate zone. And this to me is the clue to understanding something that is personally fascinating to me. And it revolves around why people believe such weird things. And, and why, either as a consequence of the approach of the millennium or the breakdown of traditional values or the density of electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic radiation or for some reason, uh, a balkanization of epistemology is taking place. And what I mean by that is there is no longer a commonality of understanding I mean, for some people, quantum physics provides the answers. Their next door neighbor may look to the channeling of archangels with equal fervor. Uh, I mean, if this is not a balkanization of epistemology, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, it is accompanied by a related phenomenon, which is technology or the historical momentum of things is creating such a bewildering social milieu that the monkey mind cannot find a simple story, a simple creation myth or, or redemption myth to lay over the crazy contradictory patchwork of profane techno consumerist post McLuhanist electronic pre-apocalyptic existence. And and so into that dimension of anxiety created by this inability to parse reality rushes a bewildering variety of squirrely notions, um, epistemological cartoons, 
if you will. Uh, that And conspiracy theory, in my humble opinion, I'm somewhat immune to paranoia. So those of you who aren't, you know, gaze in wonder. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, conspiracy theory is a kind of epistemological cartoon about reality. I mean, isn't it so simple to believe that things are run by the greys and that all we have to do is trade sufficient fetal tissue to them and we can solve our technological problems? Or isn't it comforting to believe that uh, the Jews are behind everything or the Communist Party or the Catholic Church? or the Mason. So, well, these are epistemological cartoons. It's, uh, you know, kindergarten stuff in the art of uh, amateur historiography. Uh, I, I believe that the truth of the matter is far more terrifying. That the real, the real truth that dare not speak itself is that no one is in control. Absolutely no one. You know, you don't understand Monica, you don't understand Netanyahu, it's because nobody is in control. This stuff is ruled by the equations of dynamics and chaos. Now there may be entities seeking control, the World Bank, the Communist Party, the rich, the somebody or others, but to seek control is to uh, take enormous aggravation upon yourself uh, because th this, this process that is underway will take the control freak by the short and curly and throw them against the wall. <laughs> it's like trying to control a dream, you see. The, the global destiny of the species is somehow unfolding with the logic of a dream. Well, now a Jungian would say, no surprise here, history is the collective dream of humanity. It is run by archetypal energies. It is downloaded by the zeitgeist into the various milieus and epochs of, of uh, which it is composed. Uh, this, this seems reasonable to me. I don't, I don't want to give you the impression it's too linear to understand that what I am saying is that awake is good, asleep is bad. I, what I would rather do is explain this whole gradient of possible positioning vis-a-vis -vis your life and your destiny, these choices that you have, and then have people understand that they choose you choose to be asleep or partially asleep or fully awake or to be one part of the time and in some situations and one part of the time and in other uh, situations. Now, if in fact we exist inside some kind of morphogenetic field that is created by the sum total of human minds on the planet, and if in fact in half or more of those minds at any given moment the rules of the dream hold sway, then it is no uh, surprise that when we make our way into society or, or just when we live our lives, there's an eeriness to it. There's a fatedness to it. There's a plottedness to it. Uh, you know, we are inside some kind of engine of narrative, I believe. Uh, you know, some science fiction writers such as Greg Egan and others have suggested that this could even be a form of recorded medium. The, it look, you can see the thumbprints of editors on our reality if you are truly paying attention. I mean, if you're a devotee of the theory of stochastic and, and uh, <clears throat> random unfolding of events, then you have to look very carefully at how unrandom and how mythical and archetypal uh, most people's lives are. Uh, you know, if you take psychedelics and hurl yourself 
to the edge and spend time with strange aboriginal people in remote parts of the world, the cosmic giggle becomes your friend. But in fact, uh, ordinary people's lives, everyone's lives, are touched by deep magic. And I've, you know, again, the, the primary datum is experience. And then the models are built backward from the primary data without prejudice and in an attempt to transcend historical momentum. And when I do that, what I see is that the, uh, the carrier of the, of the field of the cosmic giggle in most people's lives is love. Love is some kind of output which messes with the uh, entropic tendency toward probabilistic behavior in nature. What do I mean by that? I mean you can be the janitor at Microsoft and uh, the chief, the vice president and chief of operations, his daughter can bring him lunch one day and you can, from a distance, have your eye fall upon her and fall in love with her and you know from that point to having the five children she bears you go off to Harvard and the Sorbonne it's just a matter of running the clock forward <laughs> and these things have I mean to you it may seem like a miracle but to to those of us who are students of human happenstance it's inevitable I mean, you can launch your story. And I've, you know, in the course of taking psychedelics and looking at my life and other people's lives and narrative, I, I think that the, the secret of, I don't want to say anything as pretentious as transcendence or enlightenment, but the secret of, uh, of taking hold of uh, one's destiny is to understand that one is a character. A character is a different thing than this model you inherit out of the idea that you're a three-dimensional animal inside a democracy with a Christian heritage and uh, you know a Dewey Decimal cataloging system or or whatever. Uh, anyway, these are some of the notions that occur to me in the context of, of, uh, of comparing dream uh, on many scales. It's, you have to uh, really struggle, I think, to believe that you actually live inside the model of reality that science and Newtonian physics and the mathematical analysis of nature have given us. Uh, you know, not to get too philosophical here, but uh, for positivist nature have given us, uh, you know, not to get too philosophical here, but uh, for positivist philosophers, everything that is important, color, feeling, taste, tone, ambition, apprehension, appetition, these things are called uh, secondary qualities. In other words, they're peripheral. They arise at a lower level of understanding. They are somehow determined by the presence of the animal body and hence dismissible by a theory of pure abstraction, which says, you know, what is real is spin, charge, angular momentum, none of these things are very rich concepts uh, for a living human being. Who knows what any of these things are, you know? So, one, I mean, there, we don't have time in a, in a situation like this to explore all the implications uh, of this dream analogy that I'm pursuing, but one that interests me 
uh, is the plasticity of time in the dream. And I think I would argue, as the devil's advocate, that it is the plasticity of, of historical time and the acceleration, the sense of an out of control spin up or spin down into new domains of possibility that is the strongest evidence present at hand that we are in some kind of dream. I've struggled my whole life with, I've, I've always believed or I've always felt the power of the statement, the world is made of language. But of course, you think about this proposition for 30 seconds and the question that arises then is if the world is made of language then why isn't it the way I want it to be you know why does it have own it has its own raison d'etre even if it is uh, language well I think and it's appropriate to speak of this in to an audience as digitally sophisticated as I assume you must be I think the primary insight that has been secured in the, in, here at the end of the 20th century, the primary contribution of, of 20th century thinking, if you will, is to have understood finally that information is primary, that this world, this cosmos, this universe, this body and soul are all made of information. Information is a deeper and more primary concept than space, time, matter, energy, charge, spin, angular momentum. The world is made of language. The implication for the digerati is that reality can therefore be hacked. If reality is made of language then what we're saying is that it's code and if it's code then it is far more deeply open to manipulation than we ever dared dream I mean we've been messing around on the desktop uh, opening files with religions and political systems and xenophobic theories and racial superiority all this crap that haunts the human historical adventure it means we have not addressed the deeper level and in thinking about this and the relationship to dream and human culture it I have realized that <clears throat> cultures are, are like operating systems. We are like hardware. The human animal is a piece of biological wetware slash hardware. And uh, it has been, we know, pretty much as we confront it today for at least 140,000 years. Uh, at Classis River Cave Mouth in South Africa, they have excavated Homo sapiens sapiens skeletons, a hundred thousand years old, and that person could have sat in the front row here tonight and nobody would have batted an eyebrow. So the human hardware has been in place uh, for a while. What has changed rapidly in comparison to the rates of biological evolution is uh, are the operating system the people who excavated Ur which was at that time thought to be the world's first city and in any case is the city seven millennia old uh, when, when they excavated the central plaza at Ur they discovered that a, a black basaltic slab had been set up there uh, by the earliest kings of Ur and that was the cultural operating system and if in a deal trading goats for olives the dispute arose people had reference to the central operating system and these things were determined well now Ur 101 was fine for olives and goat trading but it didn't support uh, higher mathematics, it didn't support uh, rational exploration of nature, 
uh, it didn't support astrological knowledge about the, uh, the movement of the stars. As we have gone forward through culture, we have swapped out these operating systems. And at each swap out, there, there has been a lot of hair pulling and cussing and screaming. Anyone who has installed a new operating system is completely familiar uh, with that sickening from the bowels kind of coldness as you know you realize it all hangs by uh, a thread. Uh, now this situation or this operating system metaphor I think is a useful one for understanding and again a circle closes the balkanization of epistemology that causes me such anxiety. Uh, if you meet uh, an Aboriginal person from the Amazon, for example, they may be running Witoto 3.0 as their operating system, nicely supports uh, animistic magic, uh, huge capacity when it comes to making fish traps and bird traps. Uh, Witoto is a powerful operating system for a rainforest Aboriginal. Uh, in our culture, you know, there are, I have no idea, at least 10 or 20 operating systems all going at the same time. Uh, some will run Mormonism, some will support Catholicism, others uh, Kabbalah goes at the speed of light, uh, others support quantum physics, some support econometrics, others support political correctness, and uh, these things are mutually exclusive. And, and so looking at this, and looking at this clash of operating systems, I've come to the conclusion, and some of you may have heard me say this before, that uh, culture is not your friend. That's the final conclusion. You see, well, this came to me a few months ago when I had my yearly physical. And as I was buttoning up, my doctor said to me, he said, you know, uh, in the 19th century, uh, most people your age were dead. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized that, uh, that this was true. And that one of the, among all the revolutions that we are enduring, one of them is that we live nearly twice as long as people lived uh, very recently in the past. Well, culture is a kind of neoteny, and I don't want to belabor that at great length, but for those of you who are not biologists, neoteny is the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. It's used to describe animal behavior. For instance, I'll give the most spectacular example of neoteny. There is a kind of animal which lives in ponds in Africa, and it reproduces like a fish. It lays eggs on the bottom of these ponds. More fish-like animals come from these eggs and so forth. However, these eggs and so forth. However, if the pond dries up, the creature undergoes metamorphosis and becomes an animal somewhat like a gecko and lays eggs and from these eggs come creatures that are like geckos. In other words, this is an animal which actually achieves sexual maturity in two forms depending on environmental stress. Spectacular example of neoteny. Turning to human beings, a less spectacular example, but relevant to us, is our hairless, our general body hairlessness compared to other primates. We look like fetal apes. Uh, human beings look like fetal apes. Uh, why? What is neoteny? Well, this is hotly debated among evolutionary biologists. But the point I want to make is a socio-political comment, which is culture itself is some kind of neotenizing force. Because what it, culture provides is a bunch of rules, 
so you don't have to think, and a bunch of myths, so you don't have to think again. The culture has all the answers, you know. You want to know where people came from? Well, when the sky god got out of his canoe at first waterfall and took a leap, then we, the true people, appeared like ants, and we've been living here any ever since. Oh, huh. gee, thanks. Uh, I'm glad I asked. Uh, you know, this is what culture does for you. So. But now technology throws a curve, and the curve is that we live so long that we figure out what a scam this is. We figure out that what you're supposed to work for isn't worth having. We figure out that our politicians are buffoons. We figure out that professional scientists are reputation-building, grab-tailing weasels. We discover that all organizations are corrupted by ambition. Um, you know, you get the picture. We figure it out. Well, then, as intellectuals, and anybody who figures it out is an intellectual, believe me, because they're slinging the programming to push you the other way. Uh, so then intellectuals, defined as people who figure it out, uh, discover that you are alienated. That's what figuring it out means. It means you understand that the BMW, the Harvard degree, this whatever it is, that this is all baloney and manipulated and hyped and that mostly you have a bunch of clueless people who are figuring out which fork they should use. Uh, <laughs> but this position is presented as alienation and therefore somehow tinged with the p potential for pathology. You know, it's a bad thing to be alienated. Now let's speak for a moment in order to fulfill the promise read by in the introduction uh, about psychedelics and what are they doing in this fine situation. Well, what they're doing is, is forcing this maturation process by dissolving boundaries, which is what they do, which is what they do. They are exposing the cultural operating system for what it is, which is just a bunch of hacked together rules that evolved over time. They weren't sent from God, from Mount Sinai. Uh, it's just a bunch of hacked together rules. So psychedelics in that sense spread alienation. But what they alienate us from is preposterous, earth merging, sexist, consumerist, shallow, trivial, inane, insane, and dangerous. And that's what they alienate us from. So again, this neotenizing thing is like the condition of unconsciousness that I described as the precondition for the cosmic giggle. Glamour, acts of magical conjuration, hypnotic delusion and illusion, uh, hysterias, fads, pseudo-revelations, uh, strange truths whispered in every quarter. Uh, this is the character of uh, our time. And people have seemed to believe that they were fulfilling their responsibilities intellectually, people seem to feel they are doing that when they reject the past, say, well, you know, that was all screwed up, but since I got with Master Shuggy, I've understood, you know, the way it really is supposed to be. No, this is just trading one set of, of neotenizing operating systems for another. The, the real hard choice that you're being pushed toward and that you might consider making before the yawning grave rings down uh, the curtain on this cosmic drama is actually intellectual responsibility, freedom, and uh, uh, a devotion to uh, what scientists call elegance of thought. 
you know, people say, well, how can you tell one theory from another, and is science better than religion, and this and that. Uh, after a lot of arm waving, it should be conceded that the final call is aesthetic. That because we are monkeys, because we are so far from God, we, ca we cannot set knowing the truth as the standard for choosing among <coughs> the models we can produce. We must set our aesthetic compass towards the more true, what Wittgenstein called the true enough. And then the question is, well, how do you, how do you recognize that? Well, this is a rich field of human study called philosophy of science or theory, epistemology and ontology. How, how do we know uh, what is real? But Plato, who all the rest of philosophy is a footnote up on, Plato said, you know, that the key lay in the concepts the good, the true, and the beautiful. The good, what is it? Tricky, tricky, tricky. The true, what is it? Trickier, even trickier. The beautiful, what is it? Easy to discern. The beautiful is easy to discern. You are going to be condemned to live out the consequences of your taste. <laughs> really, really. And if you have no taste, you know, God help you. Because you, you are, you are self-condemned to an appalling nightmare. Uh, you won't be getting it. All the subtle stuff will go by you uh, while, while your head is uh, filled with can't, nonsense, foolishness. So again, the, the, the metaphor of, uh, of the dream and of making choices based on beauty. And beauty is, uh, is downloaded into the human cultural milieu largely through dreams. Uh, other ideas may also come in dreams, but I think studies have shown that, uh, that architects, designers, people who are actually at the top of the, of the pyramid in any design process are very aware of their dreams, their reveries, their insights. So that's, that's the way to set the compass, not toward truth, not toward the good, not because these aren't fine things, but because they're so slippery, but toward beauty. And with that in place, uh, to my mind, life, hope follows as a natural consequence. You know, we talk a lot, and I'm sure there are people in this room who are well versed and connected into the world of virtual reality, which is a very hot topic and may have all kinds of implications for our future and the, and the evolution of consciousness. But it's worth pointing out that uh, we have been making virtual realities for a very, very long time. That language, spoken language, is the original code for hacking virtual reality. And when you sit the children down around the fire and begin to tell the old, old stories and the pictures rise out of the flames, that is virtual reality. And so is, and this is the point I want to make, so are all the artifacts, all the impedimentia of human existence. I mean, a, a virtual reality built in aluminum, stucco, steel, and glass is not immediately erased the way you clear a screen. And the cost of making it is great. But Ur was a virtual reality. The Agora at Athens, ancient Rome, Canterbury Cathedral, uh, these are virtual realities. Uh, men and women have 
toiled at agriculture, at warfare, at child rearing, at many, many activities in the long march towards self-definition. But more and more we have, and this is true even of societies that are aboriginal and without economy, when we free ourselves, we are not freed into a void. When we free ourselves, we are freed into the dimension in which art is an obligation. And I, this is the great turning point. I mean, I, I think that the design process, whatever that means, must become conscious, global, integrated. The entire human domain, which means the entire planet and its surrounding near space, should be enclosed and included in a coherent plan driven by human values and a thirst for transformational beauty. And I mention this because I believe that many of the people capable of making major contributions to that are in this room or within a hundred miles of, of this room tonight. And we are people of immense privilege by any way of slicing the planetary demographic even the poorest among us who wheedled their way in here this evening uh, are in the top 1% of the planetary social pyramid on a planet where hundreds of millions of people are starving. The, the obligation upon the conscious people near the control uh, surfaces near the levers of the human machine is immense. So uh, with freedom, and I know this is a cliche, but hopefully not in this context, with freedom of that sort comes enormous responsibility. And it's paradoxical. Responsibility to dream and coexisting and simultaneous with that, an obligation to awaken. In other words, an obligation to make sense, be non-trivial, not to squander resources in foolishness, uh, uh, an, obli foolishness uh, uh, an obligation to awaken, and an obligation to, at the same time, dream. And then, you know, the rational mind screams out, but this is impossible. This is paradox. But the subtle mind understands that we have now reached square one by openly confronting the necessity for paradox and by openly confronting the fact that we can only enclose our dilemma by speaking in at least two modes at once, we begin to actually honor the complexity of the situation. And so tonight, the thought I want to leave with you is the simultaneous project of awakening and the simultaneous project of entering deeper into the dream for, a, for the purpose of cultivating, evoking, experiencing, remembering, transmitting, and communicating beauty, which feeds back into the awakening process. Otherwise, the awakening will be traumatic and demoralizing. We will awaken to a, a, an AIDS-ravaged Earth, to ecotastrophe, planetary warming, complete uh, collapse of any concern for the destiny of future generations. This awakening must not be disempowering. And the mantle that can be spread over the awakening to counteract the possibility of disempowerment is this wish to evoke, realize, and serve the project of bringing ever greater amounts of beauty into the world.
I think that's the end of the formal lecture here this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't say we will have an intermission of about 20 minutes, so you can what do you say? What do you say? And then we will get back together and undergo the more creative process and the more organic part of the evening, which is Q&A. And for those of you who can't stay for that, I appreciate your attention and, uh, and your concern. And thank you all very much. And we'll assemble here in 20 minutes. shamanic use in the Andes of South America. Um, people take, you can be a strict constructionist in the matter of psychedelics, or you can uh, cast your net widely. Uh, there are many substances in nature which alter consciousness, either stimulate or sedate or, or create more ambiguous and spectacular effects. I would describe what Datura, the effects of Datura as a deliriant. Uh, it, it, now, the shamans who use these things have special techniques both of preparation and of training uh, uh, that allow them to control or navigate around the more unpleasant aspects of detura. It tends to provoke memory loss, uh, shall we say, bizarre behavior, such as taking your clothes off in public uh, and so on. Uh, and it creates a general ambiance of uncertainty about the nature of reality. And what I mean by that is you talk to people who aren't there, you smoke cigarettes that aren't there, you answer phone calls when you're standing in the woods. Uh, <laughs> from the outside, it looks pretty fucked up, you know? Uh, but some Aboriginal and native traditions have managed to tame this, at least in the shamanic context. Uh, I, I guess in this matter, I'm a kind of strict constructionist in that when I say psychedelic, I have something very specific in mind that a substance or a plant should do. It should... Uh, it should not inhibit clarity. In other words, not episodes of forgetfulness, lack of memory, passing out, or confusion. It, it shouldn't interfere with that. And it should transform thought. And it should be accompanied by visual hallucinations with eyes closed. That's what I love. That's what I live for. Now, people. <laughs> People have said to me, uh, you're some kind of a sh vision chauvinist. <laughs> it's true. And, what they, and usually the people who were saying this were people who were great enthusiasts of LSD. LSD, I would never argue, is not a psychedelic. But you have to take massive amounts, and usually in combination with some other substance like hashish or mescaline, in order to elicit from LSD what I'm after, which is cascades of Niagara's of visual beauty in darkness with eyes closed. I have had deep psychological insights on LSD. I have had creative breakthroughs. I have had bonding experiences, uh, but I, have, don't, I found it difficult to get the visions like I wanted them. And the best I worked out with LSD was I would smoke as much Afghani hash as I could at the top of the trip, and then it would do the thing, in fact. It, it, it would do it. Uh, 
the, the thing that led me to psilocybin or to grow mushrooms and explore that was the descriptions of Wasson and the early workers that it was it, it was easy to visually hallucinate and I had read the earlier accounts of Havelock Ellis and uh, people like that and uh, it was about you know if you've ever read in I think it's the dance of life Havelock Ellis's description of mescaline he talks about alien buildings jeweled ruins fantastically efflorescent rainforest growing and transforming before his eyes that's what I was after I wanted not a disturbance in the optic nerve you know like on LSD you get those little things that look sort of like fans that creep across the walls that's more like something in the visual cortex than than something in the in the mind uh, it seems to me and and I was fascinated and who isn't I mean I never hear this question discussed but to me it was the obvious question about these visions was where do they come from you know how can I be astonished by the contents of my own mind and and astonished over and over again where is this stuff coming from and I looked at Jung and I entertained the fantasy of extraterrestrial contact and uh, I still haven't answered this question but I think it it's a question which the critics of the psychedelic experience haven't wanted to deal with you know if you read the psychedelic literature you can tell how what psilocybin does to heartbeat sperm count to perception of tone on and on they never talk about the real content you know because it's always individual and they say well science can't handle individual phenomena we measure the properties of large numbers of people well that hopelessly uh, flattens the thing um, I know this is a long answer to this question but but uh, it's it's worth laying all this out because the the lady's question raises issues of how do you categorize psychedelics which are which aren't are some dangerous and to what degree certainly detour is dangerous not only because it, of its delirium quality which makes you irresponsible but also uh, because it dilates your pupils and you can't you stumble around and at higher doses it can cause uh, convulsion and death as uh, convulsion and death which is a rare thing from what I consider the true psychedelics there is if we want to take an excursion here for a moment and learn a little pharmacology there is if you're going to talk about pharmacology there's one concept that you should get straight and that's called LD 50 it means lethal dose 50 what does this mean well you have uh, 20 rats and you give them a certain amount of let's say mescaline when half the rats die that dose expressed as milligrams per kilogram of body weight is called the LD50 and when pharmacologists assess the danger in a drug they ask the following question what is the ratio of the LD50 to the effective dose? And if the LD50 of a drug is only 20 times the effective dose, that's considered an incredibly toxic, dangerous, and, and dubious drug. A good drug is a drug where the LD50 is 200 times more than the effective dose in the case of LSD the LD 50 for man has never been determined that's how safe LSD is and we're talking about lethality here not <laughs> you know but so it's it and so people say well are there unsafe psychedelics and, and yes you just look up the LD 50s line them up and see which has the which have the better ratios by that measurement by that standard LSD is the most 
desirable. But there's, the LD50 of psilocybin is very impressive. You know, you can take a hundred times the effective dose of psilocybin and, effect, and expect to live. Mescaline, not. Mescaline has a bad profile. Uh, as an amphetamine, if you took 20 times the effective dose of mescaline, you would probably die. Of course, an effective dose of mescaline is nearly a gram of pure material, 700 milligrams. Uh, if you took 20 times 700 milligrams, you would be taking almost a complete, you know, nearly two thirds of an ounce of mescaline. And why should you survive? <laughs> After all, stupidity does have consequences. Uh, but really, uh, People always ask the question, are psychedelics dangerous? The, you know, and they mean physically dangerous. What should be said, and it's recently been pointed out to me that I don't say it very often, is that the biggest danger with psychedelics is that while you are in that open state, some moron will mess with you <laughs> and, and either lay a suggestion or plant an idea or manipulate. Why should you survive? <laughs> After all, stupidity does have consequences. Uh, but really, uh, people always ask the question, are psychedelics dangerous? The, you know, and they mean physically dangerous, what should be said, and it's recently been pointed out to me that I don't say it very often, is that the biggest danger with psychedelics is that while you are in that open state, some moron will mess with you <laughs> and, and either lay a suggestion or plant an idea or manipulate you or scare you or turn you in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily go. And this is why psychedelic etiquette means knowing your tripping partners. N uh, people who take psychedelics with strangers at high dose do come back with wild tales to tell, but uh, I don't think you can do that over and over again without having some horrible thing befall you. My mind is not I mean, some people s seem more resilient. I am not. You know, people often ask me to trip them, and, and I won't, and it's not because of concern for the legal system or the fact that I am not licensed for psychotherapy or any of that. It's because I can't stand it when people come apart on psychedelics. I, I am, you know, if you're interested in this subject or if you share my sensitivity, read uh, Carl Jung's little book called On the Psychology of the Transference, and then you will understand. In fact, that should be a standard m tome for trippers. Understand the transference. Understand what it is, how to fight it, and uh, you, you, this is psychic martial arts. Uh, good, your, your, your psychic health will be immeasurably improved by understanding the dynamics of the transference, which is quite simple. The book is not that, uh, that thick. Uh, now to answer the lady's question. <laughs> Uh, when I took Detura, I had reality distorting strange. And if I had been a personality of a different sort, I might have followed it deeper, but appeared to me to be ambiguous and evil. Not evil, maybe evil. Uh, what happened to me was this was in Nepal years and years ago. Nepali shamanism is based in part on Datura, the taking of the seed capsules. Uh, an English friend of mine who had the room next to mine took it, and I took it in my room. And it was a situation where to get to the facilities, I had to walk through his room. And he and I were friends, but we had a very slight rivalry going uh, for the attention of a woman. And, and I think this woman was not aware that either of us was interested in her, but we were both aware that the other one was aware. 
and uh, midway through my trip, I decided I had to go to the bathroom, and so I stepped through into this guy's room, and they were in bed together, uh, uh, having sex, and I, I guess I went outside, and then I, the next morning, after sleeping many hours, I, I encountered the guy, and I said, how, how was your trip? And he said, uh, it was wonderful. And I said, yes, well, uh, I saw. <laughs> and he said, what did you see? And I said, well, I, I saw that you were with Giulietta. And he said, uh, I thought so too. <laughs> but she wasn't there. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, what, what conclusion do we draw from this? That this stuff is, well, I'll tell you what took me off it finally was about a week later, there seemed to be a rash of this detour taking moving through the traveler community there in this little Nepali village where I live. And about a week later, I was buying tomatoes in the market, and I encountered a different person, but this English friend of mine. And uh, he told me he'd been taking a lot of Datura. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. I took it. I don't think I'll be taking it again. And as the conversation developed, I realized he thought we were in his apartment. <laughs> and uh, we were not. We were in the market. And you know, this tells you it's time to dry out. Uh, anyway, I use that as a springboard to, to different subjects. You were very patient. Uh, next question. <laughs> I hope I can remember what my question is. <laughs> it's a test. I, I agree that uh, there's something sort of mysterious about where these psychedelic effects come from, and I refer to, again to the sort of classic psychedelic psilocybin LSD. But the fact that you generally need to take a substance or a drug, it's a material thing, does in, in some sense sort of go in a strange way to reinforcing a pretty basic scientific, almost mechanistic view of the universe. And I just wondered if you had thought about that or, or have any. Comments. Well, let me try to convince you otherwise. I mean, I see what you're saying. You're saying that because this uh, transformative, possibly spiritual experience is causally connected to the act of tilly, connected to the act of taking a matter of a certain type into your body, that it seems to argue for the uh, materialist proposition that mind is an epiphenomenon of the functioning of brain and so forth. Am I restating it right? Well, yeah, sort of, but I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say that it forces you to conclude that the mind is an epiphenomenon of the brain, but that, but that there is some sort of real validity to chemistry, mathematics, physics, and that you talk about democratization that, that, that those things are in some sense far more real than, say, uh, channeling, uh, what did you say, uh, Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, this relates to what I was saying about the balkanization of epistemology. It, it's really strange to me that science is in the act of flinging open the curtains on a staggering vision of what it is to be alive in this cosmos. I mean, we now can look back through the Hubble and other telescopes, you know, 13 billion years to within 600 million years of the primary explosion that presumptively created this universe. Meanwhile, we're tearing open the, nat the nature of the human genome, the nature of the heart of the atom. Uh, this is the great, great age for the expansion of the, of the scientific vision. 
but the population is somehow incapable of staying up with what's going on and so we have the greatest proliferation of occultism in all forms since the 16th century it's almost as though there's a bifurcation of the culture the the scientific the makers of new science are going deeper and deeper in the direction that the rest of the public not only cannot follow them into but is actually headed the other way and uh, it's a it's a condemnation of our educational system that people have not understood that science for all its flaws is the only tool for understanding the nature of reality that has any kind of track record whatsoever the others just have a story to tell you know the buddha story the jesus story fine stories but that's all they have is a rap uh, the the amazing you see why is science different somebody could just say well but isn't it just a rap well it's it it's it's it is but it plays by slightly different rules than these other explanatory systems science is the only explanatory system where you get points for proving you're wrong you know i mean you form a hypothesis you publish a paper then you do further experiments you discover your conclusions in paper a were completely wrong you retract paper a and issue paper b and your fellow scientists say this guy does very good work these are careful thinkers you can bank on these people they're not flaky what religion operates like that uh, you know can you imagine coming out of the ashram and saying having the guru say to his students well we managed to reduce that hypothesis to rubble in the morning re meditation didn't we so you know it, it's uh, uh, I, I and then let me return to answer that question based on my original misunderstanding of it <laughs> and I would say this you cannot it is no reduction of the psychedelic experience to say that it is caused by drugs because they are material atomic systems and therefore we know all about them every electron is the yawning mouth of a wormhole that leads to quadrillions of higher dimensional universes that are completely beyond rational apprehension matter is not lacking in magic matter is magic I mean, so when you hear these people like David Dennett and all these talk show materialists running around, these people haven't gotten the news that's coming out of quantum physics. I mean, you see, there's a, there's a, pr a problem, or let me describe to you the state of play here. <laughs> the way science works is, is science uh, respects a fidelity of theory to experimental results what really thrills a scientist is when you have a theory that makes a prediction down to five or six decimal points and then you perform an experiment and it's spot on down to five or six decimal points and then everybody involved in what's going on has extremely high confidence that they're on the right track well now only one science is ever that good physics macrophysics uh, by a uh, chemistry it's good but it's not that good uh, ecology biology demography these are pretty loose they play with numbers but it's to high it's a fig leaf and by the time you get to <laughs> sociology or something like that I mean these clowns have just snuck under the tent and should actually be shown the door uh, 
and and put back outside with the card readers. So, <laughs> so for several hundred years, uh, you know, to, since let's say Galileo and serious physics, this is how it, science has been. It's been a pyramid of envy directed toward the paradigmatic science, which was physics, and which could produce this incredible uh, congruence of theory and, uh, and experimental data. Well, so then physics, of course, charges forward deeper into matter, asking deeper questions. Well, once you pass below the level of the electron, it's, it's like suddenly, it's like smoking DMT or something. <laughs> Absolute madness breaks out where before you had these wonderful theories and they were feeding back this data. Now suddenly you have backward flowing time. You have particles which, ton which appear magically on one side of an energy barrier without apparently crossing through it. Uh, you have non-locality, which seems to imply that every particle that exists is somehow magically connected with every other particle. We now have quantum teleportation, we have black holes, we have singularities. And don't be fooled, folks, what is a singularity? It's just a place where you agree that the rules are canceled because you don't know what the hell else to do. <laughs> and it, it's fine, you know, it used to be in physics that they had one singularity. It was called the Big Bang. And so you say, well, one singularity, essentially what science is saying is give us one free miracle and then we can, we can run it from there. <laughs> but uh, the, the theory of special relativity then introduced the concept of black holes and of course, uh, black holes are enormous gravitational masses, so massive that neither light nor information can leave them. And what do black holes have at the center of them? Well, a singularity. <laughs> well, how many black holes are there in the universe? Eh, 10 high 14? That's a lot of singularities if you're trying to produce a theory without singularities. I mean, essentially, that's an admission of total intellectual defeat. My God, if there are 10 high 14 singularities, you're not even doing science. You just might as well be, you know, channeling uh, Atlantis or something. <laughs> so, um, it, it, it troubles me because I think this stuff is rich, uh, that physics is feeding back and that ultimately a model of consciousness will come out of studying the, the deeper levels of the behavior, deeper levels of the behavior of matter. But the conclusions are all going to support the non-scientific, non-rational factions. In other words, Bell non-locality is real. All matter in the universe is in contact with all other matter through some kind of higher space based on their original connectivity. Quantum teleportation is a possibility. Uh, these violations, backward flowing time and violations of, of rational casuistry are all real. In other words, science, meaning physics at this point, prosecuted its agenda of deconstructing nature to the point where it let loose the elves of madness, paradox, contradiction, and peculiarity. And that can now never be put back. I mean, the dirty little secret is that at bedrock, the universe is more like a DMT flash than it is like an 18th century garden party, as we were previously assured by the practitioners of science. Uh, I think that's enough ranting on that subject. <laughs> if you want to, excuse me, if you want to ask a question, I guess this, the, what the consensus of the group is, is to go and stand, uh, or I'll point to you. The reason we didn't originally say go and stand is because if you get a nut in the line, 
there's a certain fatedness to their eventually getting to the microphone, <laughs> which if I am sensitive enough in the pointing out process, could never happen. <laughs> so this is a, we're trusting that you're That's staying. why I got up here early. Yeah, good, okay. Thanks for being patient. <laughs> Thanks, Terrence. I had a, a technical question, but I think it's an interesting one and maybe important. Uh, your name has become identified with the date 2012 mm -hmm. because you have said that uh, at a certain moment in the year 2012 an event will take place of uh, tremendous or even infinite novelty. And this is based on your work on what you call the, uh, the time wave and novelty theory and so on, which seems to indicate that it, around that date uh, something something extraordinary will happen, and you confirm this uh, by saying that, interestingly and synchronistically, perhaps I'm not sure whether that's what you appeal to, but you say that uh, the Mayan calendar also points to precisely the same date. And number three, you say that at that time also uh, an astronomical event will take place, namely the uh, conjunction of the winter solstice with the galactic center, uh, an event which only happens every 25,000 years, uh, roughly 26,000 years. So the last time that happened, our ancestors were painting bison on the walls of caves. It's a long, long cycle, this uh, precession of the equinoxes that, that brings the winter solstice around the circle of the zodiac every 26,000 years, and you say that this is going to happen again in the year 2012. What my question is uh, concerned with is, is that third element, namely this precession of the equinoxes in the year 2012. Uh, as you know, the galactic center is not on the ecliptic, is not on the zodiac, but is a bit uh, above it. And so this, the sun on the winter solstice will never be in conjunction with the galactic center. But an event that is linked with that, and I think far more precise and significant, is the fact that not in the year 2012, but right now, as we sit here, the winter solstice is moving into conjunction with the place where the galactic equator crosses the zodiac. This is happening now, 1998, 1999. Um, and I'm wondering why you look to this year 2012 and the imprecise conjunction with the galactic center rather than the precise and remarkable uh, uh, return of the winter solstice to the galactic equator where it was, again, 25,000 years ago when the cave paintings, when, when, when the, the first uh, bursts of self-consciousness were occurring in our species. And I raise this not because I think or know that there's any truth to the meaning of this, but I do find it exquisitely beautiful that this is happening right now. I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, thank you for framing <laughs> and imparting your extremely intelligent question. I mean, you got it all, almost all right, and all the details right. Uh, and for those of you who have no idea what that was all about, I'm not, I'm not sure I can help you, but for those of you who, who do know what that was all about, here's my response. First of all, your statement that the galactic center is now transiting the solsticeal node rather than in 2012. That's the only part of, you, of, of the thing you laid out that I would... Uh, yeah, that, that I would disagree with, and here, here's why. When we say the galactic center, it turns out when you turn the lights on on that concept that it's extremely slippery. Uh, the galaxy is not a basketball. Uh, it has a uh, center of mass, 
which we can't determine from where we are because we're out on one limb edge of it, it has a center of luminosity. Uh, it has a volumetric center. I mean, how do you in fact even define what the galaxy is? Because at its outer edges, it feathers out into extragalactic space. Now, what we're arguing over here is a difference of 12 years. Give, if we accept the premise that we're trying to locate a point in time where this conjunction of the galactic center and the heliacal rising of the solsticeal sun occurs. Now, if you run out and buy a program to run on your PC, like Voyager, and you look at these solsticeal sunrises over the next 14 or 15 years, it actually depends on the program you buy, uh, what the contention is that is supported. Um, this is a deep subject, very interesting, raises issues of bioastronomy, archaeoastronomy, galactic dynamics, uh, complicated issues. A, a book has come out in the last six months called uh, Maya Cosmogenesis 2012 by John Major Jenkins. He's a fine scholar. I wrote an introduction to the book, uh, but he, over hundreds of pages, can educate you and bring you up to speed about these issues. Uh, if the Maya had never existed, we would still be looking at the end of a millennium based on the Gregorian calendar. Now, we tend to say, well, you know, that the Gregorian calendar is out of sync with the Maya, that if there is a, a, uh, uh, a collective unconscious, then the European mind somehow made a sloppy download of it because the Gregorian calendar is off-keyed the Mayan by 12 years. But on a scale of a thousand years, that's a difference of 0.12 percent uh, or something. In other words, and on a scale of a billion years, what is being off by 12 years? On the scale of a million years, what is being off by 12 years? So it seems crazy to me to have, you know, violent factions for 2012 and then the, I mean, the point is that something, the galactic mind, the, the, the intelligence of the species, the integrated Gaian and galactic entelechy, something is trying to deliver a message. And it is writ large, this message, in our largest systems of defining and understanding time. Uh, we are at the end of a cosmic cycle. You can say a thousand years if you're a good Gregorianist, or you can say a Fileanist, or you can say a 5,300 X year cycle if you're a Mayanist. Or you can say a 26,000 year cycle if you're a processionist. But the point is, we are, we are there. We are there. We are in parking orbit around the eschaton. Uh, and you know, it permeates our lives. All you have to do is sit down, smoke a bomber, and look, and it's there, you know. It, it is pregnant, we are pregnant with this eschatological breakthrough. And you know, people want it to arrive in the form of ships the size of Manitoba hovering over the Oval Office, uh, <laughs> perhaps offering oral sex, I'm not sure. Uh, but, and, and, but you see, we are, we are such ephemeral creatures in time, we're like mayflies or something, mayflies who only live for seven days. Uh, in other words, our temporal window perception is so extreme. I mean, people say, well, nothing much ever seems to happen. Well, a hundred years ago, there were no movies. 
automobiles, airplanes, telephones, internet, atom bombs, antibiotics, DNA, it's endless. So in the space of, and yet people say, well, nothing much ever seems to happen. You know? <laughs> An incredible ability to not register radical change seems to be a precondition of existing in the presence of uh, radical change. Now, for those of you who care about my theories in this area of mathematics and deconstruction of the I Ching and analogizing to the Mayan calendar, uh, it, it is a mathematical game, it is an intellectual game. Uh, I discern patterns in nature that cause me to believe that science, which I recently praised, uh, has overlooked in very important aspects of reality that you don't need an atom smasher or a DNA sequencer or a probe to Ganymede to uh, register. And what do I mean by that? Science has overlooked two aspects of nature that as you sit here, I believe you can hear my case and that you will find in my favor. Here, here is what it is. The first thing which science has not taken on board is the fact that as you get nearer and nearer the moment in time that we call the present, things become more and more complicated. Now that may seem like a trivial statement, but there's no reason for the universe to work like that. Why does the universe go from simple to complicated? Why do you get, at first, moments after the Big Bang, a, an ocean of free electrons uh, at such a state of temperature and energy that no molecular bonds can form? Atomic systems can't even form because the, the bond strength is overwhelmed by the thermal energy in the system. Then it cools down and atoms condense, a more complicated thing than electrons by orders of magnitude. Further cooling, further nuclear cooking of the most primitive elements, hydrogen and helium, in gravitationally aggregated masses called stars, cooks out the heavier elements. They emerge. They were never seen before until fusion began to occur in these hydrogen masses. You get, at first, moments after the Big Bang, a, an ocean of free electrons uh, at such a state of temperature and energy that no molecular bonds can form. Atomic systems can't even form because the, the bond strength is overwhelmed by the thermal energy in the system. Then it cools down and atoms condense, a more complicated thing than electrons by orders of magnitude. Further cooling, further nuclear cooking of the most primitive elements, hydrogen and helium, in gravitationally aggregated masses called stars, cooks out the heavier elements. They emerge. They were never seen before until fusion began to occur in these hydrogen masses. And, they, and these fusion processes cook out iron, sulfur, carbon. Bingo! Carbon molecules. Now, an order of magnitude in their complexity greater than atoms, as atoms are compared to electrons. And then, you know, and I'm compressing 13 billion years of emergence here into 30 seconds, then uh, out of the molecular soup you get long chain polymers, out of the long chain polymers you get molecular tr transcription systems, i.e. prebiotic stuff, out of that you get non-nucleated DNA, out of that nucleated DNA, out of that membranes, organelles, organisms, higher organisms, differentiation of tissue, our dear selves, culture, language, technology, and the eschaton.
Now, why this is so obvious, I mean, leaving out the eschaton, if you like, that all the rest of it is self, is totally self-apparent. Why doesn't science take that on board as a major problem in the description of nature, the emergence of complexity? Well, you ask a scientist, they say, well, you see, uh, these are separate domains of nature. How atoms become molecules has nothing to do with how animals become human beings. This is bullshit. This is just some kind of compartmentalized thinking where you don't want to come to grips with the overarching metaphors that are working on various levels. The advent of the understanding of the fractal ordering of nature now makes it clear that voting patterns in Orange County, distribution of anemones on the Great Barrier Reef, and the cratering of Europa all follow the same power laws. So that's the first thing which science has staring in, its, in the face and has never taken on board. Now, I said there were two things. The second thing is related to the first. A double shot of espresso, you're really getting your money's worth here. <laughs> Uh, the second thing which science has taken on board, uh, has refused to take on board, is that this process of complexification that I just described to you, as you approach the place in time called the present, happens faster and faster. That was not necessarily implied by the first observation. The first observation was simply that there was a process which was moving from simple to complex. Now we have the concept of a process which is ever accelerating as it moves from the simple to the complex. So uh, more and more happens as you approach the present. And since these processes have been running since the Big Bang, there is no argument to be entertained that they will reverse themselves suddenly. No, they're not going to reverse themselves after 13 billion years. Duh. <laughs> so, uh, so then, but the implication of that carried to its ultimate extreme leads to a conclusion most people find too wild to entertain. If the universe is evolving deeper and deeper into complexity, faster and faster, and if now in a human lifetime we can see a small portion of this curve, it no longer appears flat to us because of our nearness in relation, you understand what I'm saying? That we can actually discern the curve. And so that means, I believe, that by extrapolating this process, we should then logically conclude that we are very near, relative to the life of the universe, we are very near to the place where this ramping up, the place where this ramping up of complexity will become so excruciatingly rapid that more change will happen in a single week than happened in the previous 13 billion years. And that then there will come a moment where more will happen in a single minute than happened in the previous 13 billion. And then a moment will come when more will happen in, in 6.55 times 10 to the uh, 23rd uh, erg seconds. More will happen than has happened. And people say, well, but that's crazy. I mean, how, what kind of universe is that, that ramp, that <laughs> Well, wait a minute, what's so crazy about this? Let's look at what the competition is peddling. <laughs> uh, what the competition would have you believe is that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. Well, now, whatever you think about that theory, in the interest of being awake, 
please notice that that is the limit case for credulity. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that if you can believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most improbable proposition the human mind can conceive of. I challenge you to top it. You know, I mean, I know the Scientologists think God is a clam on another planet, but I don't think that tops this idea. <laughs> that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. That is the art, that's article of faith number one. I say, no, no, this, this, if we're talking about universes that spring from nothing, if we're, if we're going to talk like that, then surely such universes occur in a situation of great complexity. In other words, if we're going to look for an enormous eruption of emergent phenomena, an enormous, sudden, unexpected download of novelty, we shouldn't look in a domain of zero space, zero time, zero energy, zero anti-entropic organization, that's the worst place to look. That's the least likely place where such a singularity would, be, would spring out. Where should you look if you believe in this jabberwock, this chimera, this particular beast? Where should you hunt this <coughs> snark? You should hunt it in domains of immense complexity where you have matter, energy, light, chemistry, language, machines, people, cultures, intentionality, minds, minds, minds. And if you throw all that stuff together and shake it up, it's maybe not a sure thing that you will get a singularity, but you're certainly betting right. You Now you've figured it out. So I, I think that uh, science is, is extremely hostile to the idea that the universe is complexifying and complexifying more and more rapidly. Why? It's just a matter, it's just a historical issue. It yeah. has to do with the fact that 19th century English biology was extremely hostile to what it called deism. Deism was the reigning religious paradigm of the 19th century and it's the idea that God is a clockmaker and that God made the universe and wound it up like a clock and went away. And it, what <coughs> irked those, what irked Darwin and Lyle and those people was the idea that the universe has a purpose. You see, they thought that if it has a purpose, this somehow means there is a God. And they weren't up for that. Uh, they were trying to build rational science <coughs> into a tool for understanding nature. I think we have grown beyond that, and that's a, it's foolish to wear those tight 19th century high button shoes. We can believe that the universe is following an organizational vector. We can believe that the universe is under the influence of a strange attractor. We can believe that the universe is pulled toward a future uh, denouement as well as pushed by the unfolding of causal necessity. We can believe all of that without evoking the 19th century concept of God. Now, why do I spend so much time on this? And you know, what, what's so great about all this? Here's what's so great about all this. If you, if you will join me in this belief that the universe works as I have described, it's an engine for the generation of complexity, and it preserves complexity, <clears throat> and it builds on complexity to ever higher levels. If you entertain this, guess what happens? It's like a light comes on on the human condition. Who are we in my story? Well, first let me tell you, who are we in science's story? We are nobody. We are lucky to be here. We are a cosmic accident. We exist on an ordinary star <coughs> at the edge of, an, of a typical galaxy 
in an ordinary part of space and time. And essentially, our existence is without meaning, or you have to perform one of those existential pate dues where you confer meaning, or you know, one of these postmodern you know, soft shoes. <laughs> but if I'm right, that the universe has an appetite for novelty, then we are the apple of its eye. Suddenly, cosmic purpose is restored to us. We left the center of the cosmic stage in the 13th century and haven't been back since. But this idea says, no, people matter. You are the cutting edge of a 13 billion year old process of defining novelty. Your acts matter. Your thoughts matter. Your, your purpose to add to the complexity. Your enemy disorder, entropy, stupidity, and tastelessness. Uh, and, and so suddenly then, you know, you have a morality, you have an ethical arrow, you have contextualization in the processes of nature, you have meaning, you have authenticity, you have hope, you have the cancellation of existentialism and positivism and all that late 20th century crapola that people used to uh, entertain back in the old days. So uh, that's why I uh, am so keen for the idea of novelty, because it seems self-evident. Uh, and, you know, we can argue about whether the eschaton will arrive uh, in 2000 or 2012 or 3,000, but I cannot believe that there is anybody in this room tonight who can, that the hardest thing to imagine is human history going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more years. That's impossible. We, have, we see around us the processes that make of history a self-limited game. The clock's ticking, folks. You think we can do gene splicing and internet and psychedelic <coughs> drugs and manipulation of our genetic material and star flight and atom uh, uh, antimatter and uh, uh, quantum teleportation and all these things? You can extrapolate that 500 years into the future? Don't be ridiculous. No, history is some kind of a phase transition. It only lasts about 25,000 years. Some people think that's a long time. Some people think it's a short time. It depends on where you stand. I think of it as snap, you know? One moment you're hunting uh, ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold deterbium super conducting extra stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all of mankind aboard in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. <laughs> you know? It's just first the one thing, then the other thing. Uh, but now history, which lasts 25,000 years, is this weird period where you're neither fish nor fowl. You know, you're not the hunting ape anymore, but you are not yet the, but you are not yet the 16 dimensional digital god, you know? And, and in that transition phase, there is confusion, there is uh, angst. But now we're at the end. We have no, I, I maintain anybody who's peddling angst and peddling pessimism and peddling all this stuff is just that's so two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Question. <laughs> I, I heard you on the radio uh, being interviewed a while back talking about uh, it's DMT is that the that is <laughs> and um, that got me really interested and uh, you, you you said that it was basically unavailable 
from me. <laughs> well, Is that your question? No. <laughs> well, close, close. Pardon me? No, I, I was really wondering, um, yeah, I, I had interpreted that you had said it was pretty much unavailable, period, and I was wondering if, if in fact it was available, and um, if not, I mean, that just sort of renewed my interest in psychedelics, um, which now you think is the second best choice? Well, first let me say, because it's an... And nice I'd like to hear maybe just a little more about, um, about DMT. Oh, okay. Well, first thing let me say, which is a piece of practical advice, um, the psychedelic community is, is cleverly invisible because our choices in gender expression, fashion, so forth and so on, have by crypto osmosis come to dominate the values of the culture. We can no longer tell ourselves from, from straight people. <laughs> so uh, the only opportunity where we really come out of the woodwork is a thing like this. And, but then, of course, there's a tendency to fall into old think and everybody focus on the alpha male spielmeister at the front of the room. Uh, so let me point out to you, I'm leaving, I'm going home to Hawaii tomorrow morning, but this is your community. This is your community. And whatever it is that you think you need, there are a dozen people in this room who can help you out. <laughs> and I am not one of them. Because I have a different assignment. But look around. And, and of course, be careful. Uh, but after all, this is about consciousness, right? I mean, if you're not conscious enough to uh, uh, conduct that social transaction without flubbing it up, that's probably God's way of telling you you shouldn't be proceeding toward high doses anyway. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, you wanted me to say more about it. The black and red poncho. <laughs> the man in the black and red poncho. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, it's impossible to talk about DMT, but on the other hand, it's fun to try to talk about it because <laughs> it, pushes, it pushes the horse of language into a lather. <laughs> Basically, when you smoke DMT, what happens is pure confoundment. And, you know, I'm trying to speak generally here in the sense that different people are confounded by different things. So, of course, it addresses you personally. Your, your level and tolerance for confoundment is a very uh, personal thing. Uh, people have asked me about DMT, is it dangerous? And the real answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> you know, and you deliver that line and then people laugh except the people who've done DMT don't laugh <laughs> because they understand, you know, death by astonishment is no remote possibility. Uh, death by astonishment is right there. Uh, you know, when was the last time you were astonished? Uh, it's, unless I smoke DMT, it doesn't happen to me. Amazed occasionally. Astonished? Never. Astonishment is when your jaw hangs for a long time, <laughs> you know? And DMT is simply confounding. Now, how could something be that confounding? I mean, you can imagine taking a drug and realizing that you should treat your partner better or realizing that God really exists or realizing that you should exercise more or <laughs> realizing that the planet is an organized intelligence. But, but how could something be as confounding as DMT is? Uh, 
Well, I think the answer to that, and it took me a while to get to this, is that the reason it's so confounding is because it, its, its impact is on the, the language forming capacity itself. So the reason it's so confounding is because the thing which is trying to look at the DMT is, is infected by it, it, by it, by the process of inspection. So DMT does not provide an experience which you analyze. Nothing so tidy goes on. The, the, the syntactical machinery of description undergoes some kind of hyperdimensional inflation instantly. And, and then, you know, you, you, you cannot tell yourself what it is that you understand. In other words, what DMT does can't be downloaded into as low dimensional a language as English. And so you're, you're like, I remember a B movie I saw when I was a kid and it was set somewhere in Mexico and there was a big swamp and there was a dinosaur in the swamp and at one point this, uh, this campesino comes, who encounters the dinosaur comes rushing out of the swamp and the patron of the ranch is there and this terrified guy is there in the serape and he can only point to the forest and sort of make a croaking sound and, uh, and, and, and that's what English allows you to do uh, with the experience of DMT. You just come down a sputtering mess if it, if it works. You just come down saying, you know, my God, you know, it's not what I thought it was. And this is after you've done it 20 times. It's not what I thought it was. It's not what I can think it is. It, 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 it's something, and I, to me, it's a miracle because my intellectual arrow and how I brought myself up in terms of all these things was I am a rationalist. And I am interesting, interested in testing and verifying and proceeding to define truth by non-exotic means. In other words, no archangels, no none of that. Uh, and and as I as I matured intellectually, I began to eliminate mystery from the world. You know, I'd look into some spiritual discipline conclude, no, that's a bunch of crap. I'd go to some teacher, conclude, no, this guy is a weasel. I, I tested, I, I sought the weird, but with an attitude of critical skepticism. And I assumed blithely that with this flashlight, I would soon prove there were no elves in, out there in the darkness. Turns out, no, no, this is the way to proceed because stuff which is malarkey will be exposed as malarkey instantly. You know, you just go to the guru and say, what can, I, what can you show me? And if the guy wants you to sweep up around the ashram for a dozen years or so, you say, no, I'm out of here. Uh, but when you get to DMT, it delivers. It delivers. It is as strange as anything can be, as anything can be. It is, you know, it is not only stranger than you suppose as you sit here, it is stranger than you can suppose. And what makes me wild about this is, we're not talking about something that you have to go 500 miles up a jungle river and live with primitive people and study techniques for 30 years and control. We're talking about something which if I had a pipe loaded with it in my hand, each one of you would be 30 seconds away from what I'm talking about. Well, 
you know, you've tripped and yeah, you lived in Paris and you went to Trebizond and all these things, but nothing like this ever descended. But it's not, it's not, it, it's so near, you know, it's not attained by practicing tantric techniques or building up mon it's none of that it's just near very near one toke away is this absolutely reality dissolving category reconstructing mind-boggling possibility and I feel like this is a truth that has to be told I'm like the campesino running out of the swamp and saying, you know, over here, you know, the orange thing, uh, do, do that. All right, that's enough about DMT. You've got to take hold here. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>